Welcome back to the table. Today, Ryan and I are going to be taking a tour. Is it a tour? Because it's not really a location. It's a post-apocalyptic location. It is. The game we're talking about is Revive, and we are lucky enough to have a yeah. copy of it sitting here on the table. This is probably one of the most hotly anticipated games of, hitting yeah. Essen. This is a pre-Essen release, so we're getting to see it a little early. But yeah, if you're going to be at Essen or if you're looking at games that are coming out of Essen to import, this is going to be a huge one. I have no doubt that this will be coming to America, or at least North America, soon after that. I don't know when, but uh, this is what I've been eager to get my hands on uh, for a while because it's the design team behind The Magnificent, which is a game I love. Capital Lux. A number of uh, games. A number of uh, Bad Company, which came out last year. So, yeah, they've had a number of great games along their belt. They brought on some new designers to help them with this one. And from hearing them talk about this, this was like a labor of love. This was a multi-year process of design and iteration to get to this final version of the game. And would you say it's fair to say that this game probably has more oh, yeah. mechanically going yes. on than any of those games? I think this is their their heaviest game to date. The, the Yeah, definitely the most going on, the most different parts of the game. But they do come together really well. Uh, and what David and I wanted to do was just kind of talk you through what's going on in this game, yeah. how to play the game, and I think a little bit, you'll see a little bit of like what makes it so unique and so satisfying to play. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do today, but definitely stay tuned to the channel because Jeremy Howard, who's more rabid about the game than even we are, uh, he's going to do a full review of this thing. So we're just going to give you an idea of what's going on. And like Ryan said, it merges a lot of things here, and there's a lot of things to sort of like grok, yeah, if yeah, you will. There's a lot. And if you watch the channel, you know I'm not a big grokker on the first play. My first play with this, I was like, wait, I was trying to game. catch up with everyone at the table, but you can look out at the board, you can look at your player board, you can look at the cards that are out in the displays, because you're going to be kind of doing some light deck building. Yeah. You're going to be using cards around some your board to get lots of things. And then you've got this, well, it's not it's an engine, it's called the machine on your player board, which is this network of nodes that you're going to be moving these markers, three different markers, in fact, around this thing to unlock the ability yeah. to do a lot more. Yeah, so let's talk about the game itself. So you'll see here on the map, this is the world post-apocalyptic. We've all kind of lived underground for a while, but now it's clear enough we can come out from this literal hole in the ground. Yes. We're going to be spreading out from this hole onto this map. And there's a few things on this map that are you'll want to notice. There's a bunch of different types of terrain. Some are where you can build buildings. Some are ancient cities where you can place people. Some are different types of terrain that will give you bonuses to your machine. You have some frozen lakes that give you more things to get. And then you have all of these tiles that are face down that are undiscovered that you're going to have to discover over the course of the game. And then that is kind of circled by these four in-game tiles that you can claim over the course of the game. Yeah, you're going to be doing that through a number of different actions you can take on your turn. But just to take what Ryan said a step further, when you come out from this hole, once you do, with either population, which is your little people, or building buildings, then from that point on, you have to kind of spread out from there. And spreading yeah. out is tricky here because it's not as simple as like, I'm just going to go to this next hex. You're having to spend resources, food in specifically, to kind of move out and continue moving out. Yeah, this is definitely a resource collection game. And if you see here on my machine board, there is quite a bit going on and we'll break it down. But right here in the corner, you have these little cylinders that indicate how many of any given resource you have at a time. So you have your food, which is gonna help you explore the world. You have your books, which represent knowledge. And then you have these gears, which represent technology. And then a wild crystal that you can use as anything. And you will have to spend these to do the actions in the game. You're spending those gears to build, the books to populate the world, and then the food to explore. Whenever you're doing anything on the board, you count the number of spaces from where you're going uh, from where you are to where you're going. So at the start of the game, you're all starting here. So if I wanted to place a guy in this city, it's one space away. So I have to place pay one food in addition to any other costs to place a person in that city. Now, for the future, I have to count off from this person. So if I started moving this way early, and now I want to come over here, I got to count all the way back. So you can see right away that there's a lot of strategy just looking at the map and kind of deciding which way you want to go, which side of the world you want to build into. Yeah, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you just have to focus on that direction. Right. He could come back, but from that piece and go off in different directions. And in fact, all of the players have variable powers. The one I used in my first game really let me kind of have some flexibility there because I could go off and sort of like not claim, but, but sort explore, of like yeah. stake my claim a little bit on some things and then use an, an ability 
to effectively explore really far away, which you really can't do. You have to yeah. generally slowly slog across the board to kind of like slowly explore things, which is kind of realistic to the theme. Yeah, because each player, like David said, is going to be a very specific uh, faction. And these are going to slide uh, into the side of your machine board, as you see here, and you're going to populate things on top of it. Now, these are double-sided. At the start of the game, you're going to be playing with the sunny side of the board, which gives a uh, asymmetric set of powers, um, but kind of generic ones. Now, as you play through this game multiple times, there's actually like a campaign. You can unlock the reverse side of this board, so we're not going to show it, but these are powers that get even crazier. Now, we kind of spoiled it a little bit by looking <laughs> ahead. We've played with some of the unlockable factions, some of the unlockable abilities. We're not going to spoil anything no. here for those that want to play through the whole campaign, but the fact that you're going to actually be able to improve your factions over time is pretty cool. All these factions are asymmetric. All of your powers that you can unlock are asymmetric. Your uh, action down here is asymmetric. It's all kind of uh, built to be that way. Uh, and it leads to a lot of interesting play moments because if you know somebody's ability, you kind of know maybe what they're trying to do on their turn. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of your turn, there are a number of things you can do. This is one of those games where you have a list of actions you can take. And in this case, you can take two of those actions. Yeah. You can take two of the same or you can take two different ones. If you don't take actions, you are hibernating, which is a whole nother thing that's kind of, it's not exactly like a complete reset where you're taking income or anything like that, but you are definitely you resetting are, yeah. your board by moving the cards that you've played, kind of getting new cards. So it is kind of refreshing things a little bit so you can continue to cycle through your deck. Yeah. But the actions that you take, some are very simple, some are very specific to what you're doing out on the board. The first of which is you can play a card. Again, these cards are effectively public information, right? You yeah, have them out on the table. They're face up in front of you. You're going to start with a deck of six cards. This is the deck building game. You'll notice a whole row of cards over there that you can eventually recruit. But you're going to start with six, three active and three in your discard pile. Playing a card is pretty simple. You're going to play into a slot on your player board. Now, at the start of the game, you've got four slots. You're either going to tuck it into the top and you're going to take the top of the ability or you're going to come down here and tuck it in the bottom and take the bottom ability, which is pretty cool already because you already got multi-use cards. Yeah. But you can take these tokens, these modular tokens, over the course of the game and slot them. And then if you play the card that matches the color... You so, get that too. <clears throat> yeah, you get all of that too. So you can build up some really juicy card slots over the game. Yeah, if people let you and you're able to get some of those tokens and really synergize, so you could go for a variety. So when you activate a slot, you might get a few things, but that's a little tricky because usually the variety necessitates different colors of cards. Or you could go heavy like Ryan did there, and he plays that card, he gets the gear on the card, but then three, three more, more gears. gears. Yep. And as you can see on the uh, inventory here, you can only hold six of any yep. one thing. So you can get those things, then spend them. So the, the general cycle is to use your cards in that way to collect some resources. Not to say, though, that there isn't other ways to get some. And then you're going to use those resources to do a lot of the actions out on the board. Yeah, there are, there are three actions I have to do on the board. Before I talk about those, there is one more thing you can do on your machine, which is just flip your switch. I think this is neat. You know, it is. There's a little switch. You just flip it, and you can gain any one resource. That's kind of helpful in a, in a stopgap situation where you're just like one resource short on your action. You just flip it. Now, it is a campaign game. I said some new stuff is going to unlock. There may be more with the Switch. There's some. <laughs> there may be some more stuff that happens with the Switch as you play through. And of course, if you're a gamer like me, yeah, you just flip to the end of the book and you just play with everything on your first game. But it's kind of fun to get those elements added in. But yeah, so everything that you're doing to build out on the board is going to require those materials. Uh, I'll talk about building first. Yeah. This is one of the neat things. As you're building, you're looking at these sandy areas out here on the board. And you can place a building, either a small building or a large building. And when you're trying to place these, again, you're looking at how many spaces away you are. And then you're looking at all these little terrain pieces. You want to surround your buildings with terrain. As you do, you're going to get these little markers that improve your machine. And these are code, color coded. You have the yellow, the uh, gray, and the green. And you have the yellow, gray, and green. Yeah, this is That's really interesting cool. <laughs> because this is the one of the first things that I would recommend when you teach this game is to point that out to people because you're going to look, an experienced player is going to be able to look out at the board and go, oh, yeah, there's three spots right, there's right there. There's a really That's juicy a spot. spot. If I build there, I get to move up three. Whereas building here doesn't get you anything it except you maybe the, the this, water. Yeah, yeah, it gets you this token. So you're going to constantly want to be on the lookout on this board for prime locations for sure. Yeah. Now. Part of doing that is to explore more of the board. Yeah, and that is one of the other actions. Again, 
all of these actions are going to necessitate for you to kind of use food to effectively move a distance away from wherever you have yeah. pieces on the board already. So if I wanted to explore, say, this tile, and remember all these tiles around here are unexplored, I could spend one food and explore this tile, or for instance, I'm right here, I could have just explored this tile and not have to pay the food. But whenever you do, there's the cost of exploration on the back of the tile. In this case, it's gonna take two food, two books, and in return, I'm gonna get four points and one of these cards. This is probably, would you say, the primary way, if it, not the it's only the way. the main way to get The cards, main way yeah. to get more cards in your deck. And what's cool about this is when you take a card from the display, you immediately get it so you're able to use it that turn if you have another action or on your next turn. But then you're gonna take this tile and flip it over. It's gonna reveal more of the terrain that you've seen already, but you can orient this however you see fit. And you're gonna to wanna to do that because when you lay it like this, say if Ryan had just explored this, now he's laid this down here. If he had a building right here, he'd be able to again move up on that green and you're able to even if you don't have a building, sort of position it such that you can create some yeah. of those juicy you just, locations. You just created a really juicy location right here, yeah. surrounded by three items. And if you did that with your first action, you could use your second action to build there and take advantage of everything that you just did. Exploring these tiles is also going to give you points, with this, which is this victory track over here. But what's neat is that as you go down this victory track, you're getting more rewards. You're getting these crates which are really cool because they're going to flip over and just give you resources or other bonuses that you get immediately. And you're also going to be able to move down this to earn artifacts. And that's something we'll talk about in a second. But note that you're going to want to collect artifacts throughout the whole game. And just scoring points is one great way to do that. So the last action I want to talk about before Ryan really digs into the machine board a little bit more is the population action. This is a lot like the build action Ryan mentioned, but instead of building buildings, you're going to place your people. So this is another thing where instead of using gears to build a building, you're going to use books to spread population. When you do this, you have to find those ancient cities. So here's one, here's another one. So this is going to be a fair distance unless you've built out over towards it. As those cities get revealed, it's more of an opportunity to get more population out there. One of the other things you're going to want to do here is get your population out to these far extremes because when you get there there's some end of game scoring and that's variable as well there's these four tiles and they're yeah. double-sided once you get a population on that that end of game scoring is something you can do but the population on an ongoing basis is far more important for this other part of your player board ryan you want to take that since it's on the screen <laughs> yeah as you're taking your people off and you can only put one person in, in each city so you kind of have to find more cities you're not only just placing a person and getting victory points, you're also unlocking abilities for yourself. And this is like a tiered uh, thing, like almost like a tech tree that almost will let like a you tech tree. move up and gain new abilities. And like I said, these are all asymmetric for, our, for each player. So you kind of want to look at the beginning of the game and see, oh, which of these powers do I want to build to and start putting your guys out. Now, you're not going to probably be able to put out all of your buildings and all of your guys. So you're kind of making decisions right. as you go and you're trying to focus on, on what your powers are telling you to focus on and what you're better at which I think is really interesting because these boards are not just asymmetric, you're customizing them by unlocking powers as you play. Now, that's only one half of the machine board, and this is the other half. And between these two things, I think is really the meat of the game. Yeah, the, the puzzly part, puzzly for part. sure. Because as you're unlocking these symbols, you're finding these symbols here, you're finding them maybe on some of these cards, on some of these uh, modular slots. They're gonna let you move your uh, discs across these tracks. And these tracks are all kind of intermingled here in this machine but as you're moving them you're seeing you're, you're passing through these spaces and as you pass through these spaces you're unlocking discs and these discs come over and they're gonna you know go on yet you, another track they're gonna they're gonna stack up and they're gonna give you points over the course of the game whenever you use your power same thing you're just building up these tracks but you're gonna see eventually as you uh, start to unlock you're gonna get lightning bolts or energy and energy is what's used to power your machine as you clear off these spaces, some are pre-printed with specific bonuses and some are slotted. They're just empty slots. Whenever you empty one or uncover one, you get to choose from the available set of tiles what you want to put in there. And then as a free action, use your lightning bolt to trigger it. So yeah. this is where you can like really start to chain. It is absolutely where you get a lot more out of your turn because you're able to use those lightning bolts. And like Ryan said, you can get more and more. I had four lightning bolts by the end of my game. I think you may have even had, I had more. I had like four or five because 
you can get them from going up this track. You can find them in some of the yeah. lakes out on the board. They're all over They're the all place. They're all over. And yeah. you can use those with the two actions on your turn to do a lot more than just those two actions. Because these are effectively, think of these of cards and other euros that are either one-time effects, those types of things where you trigger it, you do it, and it helps you do something on your turn just a little bit more easily. Yeah, and getting a lot of these lightning bolts and freeing this up, yeah, you'll just have so much flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you'll notice, too, some of these, like, have two arrows pointing into yeah. them. Like, I, so you need to, like, watch as you're moving. Like, I need to have the gray at seven and the green at three before I can unlock this one. And you'll even see more of these artifact symbols and some in-game scoring that can be unlocked as you're clearing out your board. Now, we talked a lot about those artifacts. Those are like ancient artifacts that are left behind. You get them from moving up this track. You get them from clearing this spot. You get them from uh, for going up the, the point track, whatever. You can collect them. And every time you get to collect one, you get to choose which color. And the color that you're collecting does matter. Yeah, you're going to collect them because you have these artifact cards. And these are going to score for a variety of different things. For instance, mine scores for however many lightning bolts I have. But those lightning pieces are one point each. But also you get another one point for every one of a purple artifact that I have. So throughout the game, yeah. I might be getting purple artifacts for my little point scoring engine. Ryan might be going for purple for another reason, but we're both going after purple. So once those disappear, I might be looking at these others because each of these have a purple, an orange, and a gray. So you can get a variety of these and score all of them a little or get a lot of one and score that one a lot. Yeah, you're, yeah, and that's that's also the game timer. When all those artifacts are gone, whoever took the last artifact gets the four-point artifact here, and then you trigger the end of the game, and then there's a variety of different scoring based on how far you went up these tracks, whether you got some of these in-game tiles, some of the cards are going to have in-game scoring. There's just a lot of possible scoring. You know, and you may be asking yourself, well, you've played these cards. Can you just keep playing cards yeah, and right. cards and cards? You can't. I'd mentioned the hibernate action earlier. At a certain point, you might not be able to play any more cards. You might be. Able, you might need to get more resources. You might need to hibernate. And hibernating, effectively, like we said, resets. You're going to take all the cards that are played around your board, put them over here. Before doing that, though, you're going to take all of the cards that are over there and add them here. So you might have a lot yeah. more than three cards here. And this is effectively how you cycle through your cards. You could hibernate. You're going to do that, get new cards. And importantly, there's yet another track that you can go up. Whenever you hibernate, you go up this track. And as you do, you get some bonuses. You get one of those tokens that you can yep. make the card slots a little better, some wild resources. Once you get a little higher, you do get the opportunity slash penalty, if you will, depending on what you're trying to do. You get rid of one of those artifacts, yeah, it so it the game accelerates a the game a little bit more. The hibernation, though, is probably going to happen, what would you say, every three to four turns Yeah, well, it just turns depends, right? Because this game is all about maximizing True. your game. You want to go up that track. You really don't want to hit that if you can help it, unless you really want that spare lightning bolt. Hibernating also gives you all your lightning bolts back. Yes. So if you have like five or six lightning bolts. But there are other ways to refresh. There are actions you can take that just get rid of cards and free up a space. There are actions that refresh your lightning bolt. There are things that give you resources. So the, the real game is trying to find ways to maximize your turns without having to hibernate too much. And you can do that by slotting these things and just getting a ton of resources, by using the lightning bolts efficiently, by finding these lake spots that give you more things that let you kind of keep on taking actions. I think it's very interesting the way that it does that. And it's difficult to, to say in the game, like how much that feels like, you know, you really like feel good when you've done so much before your hibernation. Yeah, I would say this is a game of lots of pieces and parts, parts that are each satisfying in their own right, but th they all kind of come together to make a really satisfying thing because the way this game is interconnected is really interesting. And I'm going to save some of what we could say for Jeremy's review. <clears throat> yeah, I know Jeremy review has a lot to say about the game. one of the things we haven't touched on at all, well, obviously haven't touched on sort of the essence of what the campaign is going to add. But we've also not really talked about the variability of these player powers. Each character or faction has a very unique power that's going yeah. to be able to be used. And I can tell you, those powers are significantly different. Most of them, if not all of them, come with their own components specific for that uh, player. And when you do these things, you do it for the first time and every one of the tables like, wait a minute, what is your power? It's a one of those <laughs> games <laughs> where people are like, wait, whoa, you that's crazy. No. Uh, and then someone says, well, no, yours is crazy. <laughs> right. Uh, so it is definitely one of the games. But that is Revive. This is, we wanted to give our first impressions. Ryan's played it twice. I've played it once. Jeremy's yeah. played it, what, three times three, now? Yeah. We're going to play it again right now uh -huh. after we turn this camera off. 
Uh, and like I said, take a look for Jeremy's review sometime in the very near future. But if you have any questions at all, we will try to answer them down below. And until next time, yep. make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then.